Give back to you. 
Because Lord, you alone are worthy. Father, we give you all we have this morning. We ask, Lord, to you to take centre stage in everything that we do. We ask, Father God, that it not be about the team or us in the church even, or at home. But that, Lord, your Holy Spirit will come. Your Holy Spirit will rest upon each of us this morning. And that, Lord, we would be anointed afresh, invigorated for the future, and restored in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So kids, I know you're sort of restricted to certain things you can do, but there are flags at the back if you want to grab a flag. Flag, flag a flag? Grab a flag and flag it. I know what I mean to say, but my teeth have been put in by a horse this morning. So, um, But if you want a flag, you grab it and let's praise God together. We're going to sing Raise a Hallelujah. And I know we're restricted in the things that we can do, but we've got hands We've got arms. We can praise our Heavenly Father. And Eileen, I'm very disappointed you're at the back. There are front seats. I'm going to move you forward. <laughs> I am joking. I'm joking, honestly. Uh, <laughs> it's good to praise the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Raise a hallelujah.
you don't know how many situations he has protected you from. You don't know what has been happening. You can just see you're alive, you're preserved. All is going well. You don't know how many battles he's won for you. that you're still here, you're alive, you're preserved. Yes. He's done it for you. Might not be the way you expected it to be. But it doesn't change. But he's done it for you. I remember there are times in my life I questioned, is he still with me? Does he still love me? Does he even hear me? And at those moments, I behave like a brat, a little brat, questioning him. And sometimes I just tell the Holy Spirit, help me see what I can't see. And I pray that will be your prayer today. Or even when you are faced with situations that are difficult, that the Holy Spirit may help you see how far God has brought you, the battle He has won for you, the provision in your life, even when you didn't expect to have any provision. People of God, I just want to say that our God is really faithful. He says he'll never leave or forsake us. And sometimes we feel like he's, he's left us. But his word is true. If he said he'll not leave or forsake us, then he will not. Encourage yourselves in the spirit. When your heart is downcasted, be like David. Speak to your heart. Edify yourself. Encourage yourself. walk through the fire, but you will not be burned, for he is with you. Amen. You will find yourself in the battlefield, but he is your banner of victory. Amen. And when you are afflicted, pain and aches in your body, is Jehovah Rapha our healer. He's our all sufficient God. Mm. He's El Shaddai, he's Abimezer. These fights, he has brought us. Do not be discouraged by the little things in life. Lift your eyes to the heat, for that's where your help comes from. And be encouraged in the Lord, for he's with you, he's for you.
going to work for them. The bank was saying, because you touched on Psalm 121, and that's what I've got marked here this morning. I've found that before, and I think it even said that. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? You know, they were looking up to the hills because that's where the pagan gods were in those days. They said, my help comes from the Lord, not from the hills, not from the pagan gods. It comes from the maker of heaven. It comes from God, the ruler of the world. And I want to say to you this morning, don't look to the BBC, don't look to government, don't look to your friends and your bosses, look to God. Just highlighting what the bankers said, that's where our help is going to come from. You know, we look at everything around us and we go down and down and down, we're going to get depressed if we do. We're going to go very low if we look at the world. Morally, it's in a very bad way, it's a godless world we're living in. There's good things happening too, but suddenly we don't get to see all of that, so we can go down and down and down very quickly. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And that includes Swindon and anywhere else in this world that people are. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. Praise God. He will watch over your life. Even when you don't see what's happening, as Levenka said, he's still working on your behalf. He's still doing incredible things behind your behind the scenes that you have no idea about. Wow. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. The problem is we don't look to God sometimes. We look at what's happening around us, and then we go down and down and down. It's when we've got our eyes to look up to our Lord and say, Lord, come into my life again, that's when we can break through and break through all the rubbish that we're going through and what's going on in this world. I lift up my eyes to my Lord. I trust that's what you're doing right now. And keep going, it's difficult, it's tough. But he is our shepherd, he will guide us, he will lead us on. But when we take our eyes off of him, like Peter did, we just go down and down and down. But when we keep our eyes on him, we can keep going. We can do incredible things. We can rise above it all. And God is looking to us to help other people who don't know him, who are going down and down and down, and saying, come on, you've got what you need, you've got me, we can rise above this, and together we can help other people to rise above it too. The world is going down and down and down, we know that. God is calling out a Christian, come on, rise above it. You know, you see, is our strength. Can we sing that again, Jerry? Come on, we may not know the song that well, but strength will rise. When we come before our God, our strength will increase. When we focus on Him, our strength will get bigger. Come on, church. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. Thank you, know Strength will rise above the
means come before him. It means be still before him. It means listening to him. It just means forget about everything else that's going on. Tune into God. Be quiet. When we wait upon him, it just means, Lord, come and speak into my life. Whether that's at home, whether that's at, whatever it is, wherever you are, when we wait, it means to give him a chance to speak, to minister into your life. For you to be still before him. And I think just some, right now, we just need to be still before him. Maybe you just want to take your seats. Maybe you just want to raise out your hands. Maybe you just want to kick your legs around. Whatever other way you want to do. But whatever you want to do, just wait before him just for a few moments. It's really the hustle and bustle of life can really get to us, can't it? It can really be so difficult sometimes. And God says, right now, just just wait. You know, in your own hearts, just speak to him. Talk to him. Cry out to him. Get angry with him. Whatever you need to do, he, he, he can take it. He can take it. He knows what we're going through. He knows all our emotional up and down swings. We're all guilty in so many different ways, we're all human, we all get up and down, we're all emotional, and God does emotions very well, and he just says, come on, just wait before me, just for a few seconds, a few seconds, what's God saying to you right now, what's going on in your, on your, in your head right now, it may not just be what you're thinking, it may actually be God speaking to you, because when your spirit connects with God's spirit, his spirit touches us. So your words may not be your words that you're thinking. Maybe God planting them in your head. That's how we hear from God. But we've got to have a close connection with God. That spirit, his spirit, to touch our spirit. Don't just underestimate God's power. Underestimate what God's saying to you. Because it may be him speaking to you. More than you realise. It's not just about what we think. It could be God inspiring us with his words. But that only happens when we wait before him, when we get closer to him, when we are sold out for him, when we love him, when we're living for him. He says, come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Wait before him. What's he saying to you? Maybe you can share something that God's saying to you. <coughs> Specifically into your life, but just to encourage us, you can stay from where you are, you've got your mask on. We've got Wimbledon and nobody's got any masks on. You know, it's crazy times we're living in. We've got masks on, and if we can, you want to say something, what's God saying to you? Be strong. Come on, church. There's one. What's God saying to you? Keep going. There's another one. Persevere. One or two people have said they haven't liked that word for me recently. In, fun, in a fun way. Perseverance is difficult. And God says, come on, we can do this. Come on, another word. Someone just say something. I would ask you, oh Lord, my strength. Mm. If you have the Lord as your strength, mm. there is nothing that you cannot do. Mm. Because the word says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. The Christ is anointing that is in you. Mm. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you because the Lord has anointed you. To do great works, to do great works, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord has anointed us to do greater things. He said in His name, in His name, we will do greater things at His power, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. The Lord is with us, the Lord is our strength. Yes, yes. yes when we look around us, you know, when we look around things around us, mm. there is weakness, there is discouragement, there is abasement. But the Lord says, lift up your eyes, mm. lift up your eyes. Yes. Hallelujah, salvation is coming. Amen. Salvation is near. Amen. Lift up your eyes to your maker. Lift up your eyes yes. to the one who strengthens you, the one who encourages yes. you, the one who preserves your life. Uh, in the midst of the trouble, yes. I did not say that troubles could not come, yes. but I said when you go through it, oh, yes. it will not bend you. Amen. When you go through the rivers, it will not overwhelm Amen. you. Yes, lift up your eyes. Uh, rejoice. Uh, yes. For the I have said unto you, troubles will come. But to rejoice, cheer up, for I have overcome the world. Amen.
to nip up your eyes to what you can see, nip up your eyes to what God can see. What's going on? How's God going to use you to encourage other people? Not just now through COVID, the next one's going to be something else. What's God going to do? Behold, I made more things than you. Yeah. Yeah. You are pouring new refreshing to her pouring in spirit. Yeah. He's a wake up on the Lord. Yeah. I will be used. Yeah. Thank you. You will rise up. Thank like you. Amen. Hallelujah. You say, yeah. my God is my strength. Mm. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. I yeah. will wait for him. Yeah. I will listen to him. Yeah. I will obey him yeah. because he's faithful. Yeah. He's my God. Yeah. Rest in the Lord. Yeah. That's where my strength comes from. Yeah. That's where my joy comes yeah. from. Yeah. Knowing, looking, and waiting on the Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Bless you. I just have an image in my mind of, um, perhaps it's just the way my mind goes, but I had the eagle soaring up here, and I had the dodo down here, and it was like, it's your choice. It's your choice. You can either choose to be down there and extinct, or you can choose to be soaring on the wings of eagles. And the fact that you're soaring doesn't mean to say that everything's okay, doesn't mean to say that you've got it all together, doesn't mean to say that it's in your strength. It's in his strength under his wings, Amen. in his authority, Amen. but the choice is yours. Amen. We'll be talking with eagles, and not long ago, Lord, I just had that eye set in prayer, and I saw myself sat on the wings of the eagle, and he was soaring. Mm -hmm. I just felt such overwhelming joy. sensible and we're wise, we will wait upon the Lord. Just take your seats for now. And, uh, so just, no, thank you. just stand up while you're at it. Just, um, just put your mask a bit like that, okay? And just have a bit of air. Go on, just have a bit of air. <laughs> Lovely that. Brilliant films, all that. And, um, so just wave to the people around you. We can't huff, we can't shake hands, we can't do anything, but we can wave. And those at home, wave, welcome, good to see you on Facebook Live. And um, just wave, just to wave and just to see and each other and, um, and um, thank you to the worship team. And, um, I want to share a, a few thoughts with us. Um, we're going to do it in two sections this morning and um, change it around a bit. But yesterday, Debbie and I, we went out for a little bit of shopping. Nightmare. But we went out for a bit of shopping yesterday and six shops we went in. Each time I had to wash my hands or, oh, you know, sanitize them. Six times. I was thinking, I've got the cleanest hand in the world, you know what I mean? I'm fed up with cleaning my hands, it's just cleaning my hands. And all about, you know, with the government is about make sure you wash your hands, you clean your hands. But not once have I heard about cleaning our hearts. Because that's more of a problem than cleaning our hands. In the world in which we are living, we need face, hands, whatever else, and hearts. We need to wash our hearts, we need to clean our hearts, we need to purify our hearts, we need to sanitise our hearts. Because we're living in a very corrupted world, aren't we? You don't have to read much or look far to find out how corrupted our world is. Just turn on the news. It's very corrupt. And it's getting worse. It's horrific what people are capable of. But that's the world in which we're living. Ephesians 4, chapter 1 says, I urge you all to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. As it happens to all Christians, that's what Paul wrote back in his day to the Ephesians. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And that means, if we're going to do that, to live lives that are pleasing to God. That means we need to deal with our hearts on a regular basis. Because we can get caught up in stuff that takes away 
from our Lord. This verse sets the tone for my talk. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, because it's very easy to get caught up in the world that we are, and we're not living to the way that God wants us to live. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, probably not what did it? Can you still hear me? I urge you to keep living the life worthy of the calling that you have received. In other words, keep checking yourself over how you are living for God in a world full of temptation and corruption. We've all heard the saying, what a character they are. You've been in meetings, been in parties or whatever. The life and soul of the party, what a character, what a person. Well, they may be humorous. They may be opinionated, they may be teller of jokes, they may be whatever, but what a character. And we can often say that about the people that we meet. What one word would you sum up, you've got 15 seconds, don't shout it out, to sum up your character? 15 seconds, here we go. I went nuts on but I'm not going to. Answers on a postcard, or send it to me by a text, or whatever. You've got eight seconds left. What one word would sum up? Your character. <laughs> love. Wow. I love that. That's brilliant. Good we can get away with it. No, yeah, that was fun. Okay. No, I'm not. And, uh, <laughs> love is a great one, isn't it? How would you sum up your character? Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. Turn with, to it with me if you've got your Bible. I've already had verse 1. Now we're going to move on to chapter, uh, verse 15, uh, no, we're verse 25. Ephesians 4, verse 25. You've got your Bibles at home, waving them around, waving them around. Have you got your Bibles here? Wave your phones, your iPads, whatever else you've got your Bible on. Ephesians 4, verse 25. And then, of course, this is Paul speaking all of this. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his or her own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building each other up, according to their needs, that he may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. What one word, you can shout it out if you want, would sum up that passage? Integrity. Spot on. Absolutely spot on. Integrity. And that is the word I want to touch on this morning. Thank you, Levenka. I don't know if you said integrity about yourself when you were you know, thinking about that, that one word that would describe you, but I believe integrity must be on our high on our list of priorities when it comes to assessing who we are and how we're living our faith and what Christ expects of us. But not just that, but living morally too. How would Christ want us to live? It's with integrity. Integrity is a Christ-like life of consistency and sincerity. It symbolises the sum of our actions and existence. It's not something we have, but something we are. Do you have integrity? It shows itself in what we do, in what we say, and how we live our lives. The Apostle Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians 1 verse 10, Be pure, sincere, and blameless until the day of Christ. In other words, until Christ returns, aim to live pure lives, aim to be holy, aim to be blameless, live lives that are pleasing to God. We're living in a world where I've already said where integrity is an all-time low. Even in the past year, some government officials, the MPs, have really let themselves down pretty badly. Even in the last two weeks, it's been pretty shocking as well. Integrity is missing in so many areas of life, and at times we're all guilty. We can't point the finger to anybody because we all fall into that category. 
But more than ever, integrity is not a character many people want. Why? Because we like to cover things over. We like to put a bit of spin on something. We like to tell lies. We like to show a bit of deceit. Because that's human nature, isn't it? We like to cover it up. Integrity means we've got to face the consequence. It means that we will live to how God wants us. It means that we will change our behaviour. Integrity is an a incredible word, really. Things get covered up, lies, spin, and eventually the truth comes out, often when people are found out. Integrity, what are you doing with that word? The word integrity means an unimpaired condition, it means sound, it means whole, adhering to a code of moral values, incorruptible, honouring, the quality or state of being complete or undivided, it means honesty, upright and truthful. Challenge yourself this morning. This isn't for me to challenge you. This is for God to challenge you. Using me, I know nothing what's going on in your mind, in your life. How are you when it comes to integrity? I read this funny quote. It says, the best measure of a person's honesty isn't on their income tax book return form. It's the adjustable button on the bathroom stairs. <laughs> How honest? Who moves them like I do? Moves the scales a little bit when you stand on them just to get, make sure you get to the right. <laughs> I move it around the bathroom just to try and get the right weight. I do. And um, <laughs> then I feel happy with myself because at least you can get to that figure, even if it's not a true <laughs> understanding of my weight. Sad, I know. But talking of scales, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you place integrity in your life right now? How would you rate your integrity? 10 being best, 1 being the worst. This is between you, yourself and God. Integrity is difficult to find in other people. It's often difficult to find in ourselves. <coughs> Today, when you look around, there's not a lot of integrity. But it's a quality that impacts every area of our lives and also those that we come into contact with. When we don't have integrity, it can really affect us and affect other people. Too many people live disjointed, inconsistent, compromised lives, Christian or not, while other live, others live a dishonest life. It's all out there. And sometimes it's in here. Some people are not faithful, while others can't be trusted. People live one way at work and another way at home. People follow one code of conduct at church, yet follow another code of conduct outside of church. People cut moral corners when no one is looking, but convince people they are righteous when they're in the limelight. And we can go on and on, and I will. People tell lies to cover their tracks, but they to be honest when they're with other people. People live compromised lives partly due to habits or what the world throws at us, or simply because the society endorses a who cares attitude. It doesn't matter. As long as you're looking after number one, pleasing self, if you can get away with it, then you're doing okay. That's what the world says, doesn't it? It doesn't come from a moral Christian angle anymore. It's okay to lie to your spouse so long as you're good at your job. But Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, if, well, he thought a little bit different. He said, if you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibility. In other words, he is saying, do not live fractured lifestyles. Live consistent to your calling. Don't say this and then do that. Don't be this and then be that. He says be strong to your convictions. Yeah. To live to what your calling is. He calls us to live a life of integrity, consistency, living to what our faith demands. It's tough work, I know that. I'm no different to you. We're, all, we're living in it all the time. It's probably harder for us at times. It's a tough world. But he says, take your eyes off of God, you're going to sink, like Peter. But he says, keep the integrity. You may have to stand out from the crowd, you may be ridiculed at work, but keep your integrity. Don't compromise for the sake of people just buying you a coffee or just want to be with you or whatever. Don't compromise your relationship with God, because it will come around eventually. People may laugh at you, they may think you're weird, but they do that anyway. <laughs> you know, live to the life that God has called you because He will come back around and people will trust you, people will be able to talk to you, people will want what you've got. 
we're living in a world that people are just not living to how they should be. And that's Christians as well. The world says if no one sees you cheating, lying or stealing, or if you don't get caught, it's okay. Because unless you get caught, you haven't technically done anything wrong. That's the world view. If you get caught, then that's a different issue. But if you try and hide it, then it's okay. And God says, actually, no, that's not how it works. Gideon, Moses, Mary, Samson, Esther, David, Paul. Men and women that God knew he could trust because their integrity was strong. They wobbled. They had lives. They were human. But their integrity kept them going. It was the one characteristic that distinguished their lives. How much can God trust you right now? Trust me. Trust us. Trust us as a church. Trust us as a community here. Trust us in every aspect of our lives. It's difficult, isn't it? You have a, if I don't get caught, then it's all right attitude, or I will live to please God in everything attitude. We're human. We're going to struggle, but that's what we need to aim for, isn't it? To live strong. Remember, integrity doesn't just refer to the big issues of life. It's about the little things. Yeah? You may be even thinking that it doesn't really matter that much, but everything matters. Someone said without integrity, there is no trust. If there is no trust, there will be no foundation for any spiritual, personal, or church success. Take away integrity, and it all crumbles. Take away integrity from government, from family, from business, from church, and we see it in church, it all crumbles. It may take a while, because any building, when it falls, it takes a while to come down, but eventually it will come down, when integrity has been removed, and we've seen it time and time again, the word integrity appears 16 times in the Bible. And is without doubt the key factor in our faith, remove it, and everything falls flat in our life. It may take a while, but it will. It will come back and bite us in some point, and it will damage our relationship with God, and it will damage our relationship with other people. Engineers, any engineers here today? Any understanding of engineering? Engineers know all about integrity, or structural integrity to be precise. Structural integrity is the ability of a structure to withstand its intended load without falling or failing. When steel in particular is put under stress, it will not support the weight without integrity. It will collapse or fail or fall. Yeah? We've seen these engineering programs on TV. We saw that also in Miami recently, didn't we, with the condo collapse. When integrity is being removed, buildings will fall flat. That's what they're saying. Integrity is the language of engineers. Is it the language of our faith? Do we have integrity in everything that we do? Are we waking up in the morning and checking out how we're going to do? Or are we going to compromise in our faith? Because if we don't have integrity, everything will fall flat in our life. Integrity really is a thing in a person's heart that says, I will do what is right. I will do what is right, no question, no compromise, no doubt, no second thoughts. This is what I'm going to stick to. Because when you get out there and you turn on something in the corner of your room, suddenly integrity can go out the window. Because things are being bombarded at us all the time. It's okay to lie. It's okay to cheat. It's okay to sleep around. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. But Jesus says, no, it isn't. If you've got integrity as a Christian, you won't do that. If you've got integrity as a person, you won't do it. Integrity is not just what people see. Integrity is what you are. Just repeat that behind your mouth. Integrity is what you are. Integrity is a lifestyle. Integrity defines you. Integrity guides you. Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed by their dishonesty. Tough words. And then we have in Job 27, verse 5, Job says, He holds fast to his integrity and will not remove his integrity. He had been through so much pain. He had been through, he lost his family, he lost everything. Yet he says, I will not lose my integrity, despite how I feel, despite what I've been through. He says, I will keep to the integrity of my Lord, despite what I've been through. How can we say that today? Can we say that today? Integrity says, I can't do this because I can't live with myself if I do. 
I can't do this because I can't live with myself if I do. That is the integrity of the heart, and that is the heart of integrity. Can I live with myself if I do dot, dot, dot? Can I? Do you? Sadly, so many people can live with themselves, despite some disgraceful behaviour. And there doesn't seem to be any conscience for that. It seems to be getting worse and worse. And that's what with Christians as well. And we have to be careful about that. We need to keep checking ourselves over. Martin Luther said, if I knew the world would go to pieces tomorrow, I would still plant my apple tree and pay my debts. In other words, I will still do what's right, even if the world was ending tomorrow. Even if it didn't matter, I will still do what's right. That's what he's saying. If no bailiff or money collector came after you, would you still pay your bills? If the boss is nowhere to be seen, do you still put in a nine-hour shift? Because that's integrity. <laughs> do you work harder when the boss is watching than when he's not? Do you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Tough, isn't it? That's integrity. My sermon title is called Honest to God. It's a saying that people use when they're wanting to, people to believe that what they're saying is actually true, that it's true, it's genuine, it's real. What I'm saying, honest to God, this is what I am saying. It's absolute true. I'm, this is my word. This is what I believe. This is what, and I want you to believe what I am saying. But I want to change the emphasis of those three words, that we will be honest to God in all that we do. That's where integrity kicks in. Honest to God. Being honest in everything so that we don't have any doubts about anything. That we are living true to the conviction that we had when we were called, when we had our salvation, when Christ came into our lives. I'm living to the integrity. Honest to God in how we speak, serve him, talk about him. That we will be truthful in everything because God sees, he hears everything. We try and convince ourselves, we try and pull the wool over God's eyes, and we try and convince ourselves that he can't see, but we know he can. We try and get away with it, we think, yeah, we're going to put the eyes over God today, he ain't going to see that little bit, He'll... God sees everything, whether we like it or not. Honest to God, being who we say we are, being Christ-like, living how we're meant to live, Christ-like, behaving how we're meant to behave, Christ-like, speaking words Jesus would speak, Christ-like. Christ, Christian means Christ-like. It means being like Christ. That's what Christian means. Are we living to the name Christian? Are we honouring God as we should? Are we Christ-like in our integrity? If you are dedicated to godly character, then integrity will be developed within you. And people will see it. And it will stand out. During the Crimean War, Florence Nightingale was visiting a hospital for wounded soldiers, she looked at one soldier who said this, and I've asked Debbie and the team to come back now. They said, you are Christ to me. The soldier said to Florence Nightingale, you are Christ to me. How do people see you? How do people see your integrity? We're going to stop for a moment and have a, a couple of songs that the worship team. You can either sit, stand, lay down, whatever you want to do. Just let the Holy Spirit come away. Wait on the Lord right now. How are you doing from an integrity compromising <coughs> point of view? Because we all get caught up in it. And God says this morning, I want you to deal with it. Right now, this is assessing our integrity in our lives. And in a moment, we're going to be challenging our, our integrity as we share on one or two other thoughts. Thank you for coming.
facing a great deal of importance on integrity this morning, and there's eight people have asked to come and just read some very short Bible passages just to highlight how integrity is so important. And um, the eight people, you know who you are. Uh, if number one could come to the microphone, please take your mask off and just share, please. And, um, and number two, if you can get ready, that'd be great. Thank you. Titus 2, 7 to 8. In everything, set an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you. So the key point, your integrity should always set an example. This is Psalm 25, verse 21. May integrity and righteousness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. So the key point. David was implying that by living a life of integrity, the Lord will look after those who honour him. <laughs> Zechariah 8, 16 to 17. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other, and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. Key point. The Lord hates lies, dishonesty, and immoral behaviour. I'll be reading from uh, Psalms 7 8. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, almost high. The key point the Lord will test and judge our integrity. Be careful how we live our lives. Mark 12. 14. The Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the word of God in accordance with the truth. People, as Jesus is a man of integrity, so must we read it. Do not let the world influence your godly responsibilities, and above all, be men and women of conviction and lead by example. Amen. <laughs> Philippians 4 verse 8 Paul says finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me Put it into practice. Key point, if we focus on living according to God's ways, then integrity will become an integral part of our lives, and whatever you think about will define your lifestyle. Uh, 
Proverbs 28, 6. Better the poor who, whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. Key point. Integrity, honesty, and honor are character traits God wants us to adhere to. Thank you for those who shared great passages there, you know, and um, things that we need to look over, but maybe you want to write them down after the service, but it's good to be checking out our integrity. We all know the phrase, the end justifies the means. This is a saying that's often used in business, but really can be applied to anything. In other words, as long as goals are hit and success is achieved, the steps taken to get there are not important. Yes, do whatever it takes to climb the ladder. We know all those sort of things are worth of success, get promotion or get results. It's often a business or employee's motto. The end justifies the means is said when boundaries have been breached. And sadly, the attitude has crept into the church where integrity is severely missing in a lot of cases as well. I've seen it sadly many times here. And like with us today, we need to keep having integrity, don't we? We need to keep checking ourselves over because it can creep into our lives very subtly, very cleverly, and very easily. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, if you've got the... We're able to find it. We're brave enough to go and find it. It's in the uh, Old Testament. Head towards the back of the Old Testament Malachi and then come back a bit and you find Habakkuk. And in verse 1, verse 2 to 4, it says, Habakkuk's complaint. He says this to God. And if you listen to it carefully, it's amazing how it represents life today. This is what, 5,000 years ago, whatever? How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. How often do we say that? Or we cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? How many times do we say that today? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. That can be summing up our world today. Why? Do you not do something? Why do you not deal with those who behave badly? What about injustice? Why don't you bring justice? Why don't you do more? And it's a question we ask ourselves so many times and have a cut. He struggled with God's answer or lack of action, and so do we today. Where is your justice, God? What are you doing? But then God answers him in verse 5, basically saying, I will do things when I am ready to do them. I am sovereign, I am above it all, leave it to me to work it out. Don't you get bothered by that. I will deal with judge, I will judge wickedness, bad behaviour, sin and immoral lifestyles at the appointed time. I will deal with this. And that's a bit of a challenge, a bit of a um, encouragement, but as Christians we need to be careful as well. Because God will judge us if we continue to live ungodly lives. We need to be living a Godly lives of integrity. Integrity is seen in the Bible a lot, but one story I just want to touch on briefly is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. The events of the fiery furnace, it happened while Israel was in exile in Babylon. These are three Hebrew boys, and they were stuck in this Babylonian area, and they were told they had to worship King Nebuchadnezzar. He demanded that all people in Babylon worship him and said, anyone who does not worship me or bow down to me will be thrown into a burning fire. Daniel 3, verse 11. As punishment, you do not bow down to me, you will be punished and thrown into the fire. But Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said, we will not bow down. We will not compromise our faith. We will not bow to anybody else apart from God, irrespective of what happens to us. And of course they refused. They were, integrity was not going to leave them. They said we will continue to serve our Lord. And when confronted by the king, the three men said we are going to stay true to our conviction. We will not serve your gods or worship you or worship the golden image that you've set up in Daniel 3, 16 to 18. We will not compromise any way at any time. And their integrity put them in the fire. 
They were in front of one of the most powerful people in the world at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, we would be rather thrown into the fire than actually bow down to you. And they stuck to their principles, and of course they were thrown into the fire. And then as we know, an angel appeared to them in the fire that protected them. And when they came out of the fire, they didn't even smell of burning. They came out whole, nothing had touched them, the fire completely unscathed them, and then King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, bowed down and worshipped God because these men stuck to their convictions. I'm not asking you to go through a fire, to go through the fires of life, but I am saying to you, we need to challenge our behaviour, we need to challenge our integrity, and what will we do for our Lord? Will we stick to our convictions, even if we are being jeered at work? It's tough, I've been there, I've been in the worldly workplace. I've had everything thrown at me. As a pastor, Victor's son, I had absolutely everything thrown at me when I was at school because of what my dad did for a job. So I know what it's like. But you stick to your principles. You stick to what you behave, to how you're supposed to behave. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego displayed absolute integrity in the face of adversity. Faithful to God in both private and in public. And God honoured them. And God will honour us when we stand true to our convictions. If you're going to sway here, and then tomorrow you're going to be saying something different, and then on Tuesday you may worship God, and then on Wednesday you behave badly, God ain't going to reward us. But he says, I will reward those, I will honour those who honour me. You know, he says that in 1 Samuel 2.30, I will honour those who honour me, and when we honour God with our integrity, he will bless us. It may not always seem like it, and it may be a long way down the line, but as the banker said earlier, things are going on behind the scenes, but we have absolutely no idea how God's been working for us anyway. <laughs> things are happening. You don't know how God's going to work. And he will work for you in the fires of life. And I tell you what, sometimes we will come out unscathed. There'll be times when we are pushed to the limits, we will yeah, we'll be affected by things, because that's life. But God will look after us, not every time, because God has his way. But stay true to God, build your life on him, on the rock, and he will protect you, and he will guide you, and he will bring you through. And we've just got to keep trusting. It may not be our way, it may be a very difficult way, but he said, stick to your principles, stick to your convictions, and God will honour it. I think the best word to sum up in integrity is consistency. Living a consistent lifestyle. That, is, that your life is, a, is, is, you know, integrity is your lifestyle. Remember, integrity does not bring us salvation, but it does bring God's approval in our lives. Is that what we're looking for today? God's approval in all that we do? Wherever you go, is God going to be happy with me now? Whatever we do, whatever we say, is God going to be happy? Is he going to be happy with the way I'm speaking today? There is very little we can control today, but one thing we can control is our character. It's up to us whether we're going to be bad, or whether we're going to behave well, whether we're going to be dishonest, or whether we're going to be truthful, whether we're going to lie, whether we're going to be whatever. It's up to us. We have the control. Be true to yourself, be true to others, be true to God, and honest to God. If you are honest to God, then you will live a life of integrity. But it takes guts to do that. It takes spiritual convictions to do that. And so I'm going to ask the worship group just to come back again now, as I finish with this. How can we improve our integrity? Well, whenever you make a decision on anything, ask yourself this, am I compromising my faith? That is integrity. And stop doing things. That's going to be contradicting your faith. How can we improve our integrity? When you make a decision on anything, ask yourself, am I compromising my faith? A real challenge today. I want you to stand right for the moment, and just wave your hand if you're able to stand up here. Just wave your arms up to the Lord and just say, Lord, come upon me right now. We've all got areas where we need to say sorry about it. And today, this is just about saying, Lord, help me to get morally right before you again, spiritually morally right before you again. If I am struggling in this area, so if you just leave it. Test yourself out. We all need to have a spiritual MOT every so often to see what's working, what isn't working, to make sure that everything is working properly. 
And those areas, we all know that I don't need to say things to you. You know exactly what's going on. I know exactly what's going on in my life. But if you feel God's pulling away at you right now, then maybe you need to do something. <coughs> maybe you just need to come true to God. Maybe you just need to be honest to God again. Not try to kid him. Not try to hide from him. It's been a difficult year. It's been a difficult 18 months, 15 months. You know, I'm in awe of you guys that you keep going, that you're still coming to church, that you still love your Lord. You know, he is so great. I know that. And he's blessed. But he just says, come on, church, raise the bar just a little bit more. Keep going. And the more integrity you have, the stronger you will be. And the more God can use you and do through you sometimes God puts us through our paces to toughen us up. It's not easy, but it's our integrity that will get us through. And just challenge yourself every Monday morning maybe, or every Friday night, or whether Sunday morning before you come to church, or whether it's every day or every couple of weeks. Just challenge yourself. How am I doing? Write these words down. How am I doing spiritually? Integrity, big words. Some got it at home. A whole lot of stuff on my wall at home. How are we doing? Integrity. Stay true to your convictions. Consistency. He says, I can use people like that. I can use people who wobble. Yes, I can. But it's a little bit more difficult sometimes. We've all got all that emotional baggage to get through. God says, I need you to be true, strong, straight away. So I need you to be doing my work for me. And if we're constantly up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, it's very difficult for God to get through sometimes. He said, be people of conviction. Be strong in your faith. Be solid. Don't be swayed by the world. Don't get down by watching the BBC. It's going to be there. We're living in the world. Get used to it. It's going to be messy. It's going to be messed up. It's going to make us angry. It's going to get us depressed if we look too closely at the world. So Jesus says, don't do it. Look up to me. Not to the hills. Look beyond me. Look into your hearts. Look into your heads. Look into your minds. Don't get bogged down with it all. We're all in the same way. I'll get angry with the world. I'll get irritated. I'll get frustrated. Because the habit says, you know, what are you doing, God? And sometimes we just don't see God doing anything. And that gives us even more demoralized. But he is doing things. But we just won't see it our way. And when you look to the hills, and when you look to yourself, and when you look to the government, you're going to go down and down and down. But God said, rise above it. Get your integrity in place. Stick to my truths. Stick to what you believe. Keep going. Stay strong. I need you to be strong today. And it's okay when we do wrong. It's okay when we do get it wrong. It's all right. But let's try and rise above it each time. And God will put us through. And God will use you in ways that you have no idea about. He's probably doing that already. And if you're blessed to have a, a partner, a spouse, come together. If you're blessed to have a family, come together once a week if you don't already do that. Maybe twice a week. Together. If you've got children, keep it simple. Just encourage each other, inspire each other to be people of integrity, to stick to our word. I love what Amy says, to be of love. When we have love, it flows all the way through our lives, doesn't it? The problem is love is missing so much today. And, and when we live in difficult times, love can go out the window, we know that. But let's get that back. Let's get that love back. Let's get real with God again. Let's stop playing games if that's where we're at. Because God says, I, I, I just want to use you more. I want to do more through you. But if we haven't got love, then we're just making a, a noise, aren't we? You know the passage. He said, when you have love, it radiates through everything. And it affects everything. It inspires people. So come on, church. Let's rise above it today. Maybe we need to change our attitude a bit. Maybe we need to get our behaviour sorted a little bit. Maybe we need to check out how we're living our lives. Is it really of God? 
promise to God are you being promised to God? And I trust you. Thank you, Lord. Just let me just read this. Let me just let me just read this. devastation in Miami, Father God. And even now, Lord, they're still finding bodies. Lord, I pray you'll bring your peace into that whole situation where it's so difficult to know how to pray sometimes. But for the lives that have been devastated, Lord, may they know your joy, your peace in the midst of such difficulty. Lord, I pray for our government. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue 
We've helped them, Lord, in these difficult times while I pray that there will be people of integrity. Raise up more MPs, government officials, Lord, with integrity, Father God, more Christian people, Lord. Well, I pray that you'll guide our government to making the right decisions, consistent decisions. Lord, I just pray for our world generally, pour out your Holy Spirit. May more lives be touched by your Spirit, Father God. Lord, as churches, well, I pray that you'll continue to fill us all with your power, whatever denomination, Lord, that we'll just, we'll just know your power and your joy and your peace and your strength at these difficult times. Lord, I pray for this family, as you know, being devastated by the evil minister who lost his life this week. He was diagnosed with cancer in June and he died two days ago. One month, 37 I think it was, two young children. Absolutely devastating. Lord, we cry out to you, even people who know you and serve you, will still get affected by all this. Lord, I pray for this family right now in the name of Jesus. And for the church, touch them, Father God. For our lives here today, for all those who need a touch from you, Lord, there's people in this church who are going through real difficult times at this moment. Holy Spirit, touch them with your power. Lord, I pray for the brain, I pray for the mindset, that you will set people free in the name of Jesus. Lord, bring them closer to you. Lord, only you can do it. I can't do it. The church can't do it. Only you can do it. Break into those areas that we are so helpless in. Come, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the good things that are happening. Give you praise that our church is still standing. Lord, that we're still able to pay the bills. Lord, we've got a new roof at the back of the church. Different things are happening. Thank you, Lord, for looking after us, for protecting us. For our family lives, I continue to pray. You'll bless us. Bless them. Lavish your goodness over them. Financially, you'll touch every area of our lives, Father God, in our relationships, in our workplaces. Father God, I pray that your spirit will flood each room that we go into. Lord, our homes will know your spirit coming alive in us. Lord, help us to touch our communities in a new way. Speak to us into their lives, Father God. Lord, pick us up when we're feeling low. And help us to pick up the people up too, Father God. Strengthen our faith. Draw us closer to you. Keep us strong, Lord. Keep us consistent in your name, Father God. Lord, for those who just need a healing touch, we'll remember Evelyn and we'll other people, Lord, who just need your hand upon them, upon their lives, Father God. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I just thank you that we are the privileged people. Thank you that we do know you, that we've experienced you. Even when we don't always know you're there, we have experienced you because we wouldn't be here today. So Lord, even the dark times and the good times, let us keep praising you because we know that you're working behind the scenes. We know you've done more for us than we could ever realise. And Lord, that keeps us going today. So Lord, keep us strong. Keep us close to you. Don't let us wobble. And then when we do, help us to get back on track again. But thank you, Jesus, that you love us with a passion. That you don't give up on us just because we have a wobble. That we act like brats, as the man could say. Lord, that we will still be in your arms. You're still looking out for us. And you still care for us. And Lord, I hold on to that today. And for the people of this church, in the name of Jesus. Sing our final song, Debbie, which is. I think we're going to do the goodness of God. Goodness of God, it yeah. is, then. We've heard this song in the last few weeks. And um, thank you for tuning in at home. Uh, for those in the church, the offering baskets are at the back if you'd like to give them away. That'd be great. And thank you for joining us. And we're going to sing the goodness of God. Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you.
give it up for Bill. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you, and we'll see some of you again next week.